1986, there was no known large source of helium-3 for use on the Earth. In that year, scientists at the University of Wisconsin rediscovered data that had been originally collected by the Apollo astronauts and NASA scientists from lunar samples in the early 1970s. Analysis of this data revealed that there is over one million tons of helium-3 on the lunar surface. When burned in a fusion reactor with deuterium, the helium-3 will release more than 10 times the energy contained in all the economically recoverable coal, oil, and natural gas that ever was on the Earth. This means that for the first time in human history, we realize that the moon contains a fuel that could satisfy the world energy needs for thousands of years to come. The helium-3 has been deposited on the surface of the moon by the solar wind for more than four billion years. A trip to the moon to procure samples of helium-3 would begin very much like those of the American Apollo and space shuttle programs. After transferring from a space shuttle at the soon-to-be-built space station Freedom, astronauts would travel to and orbit the moon in a more efficient orbital transfer vehicle. Arriving at the surface of the moon, the flight path of the astronauts might take them over one of the active helium-3 miners at work on the lunar surface. The miner, shown here, would provide enough fusion fuel to satisfy the electrical needs of a city of a half million people. The collection of this valuable gas relies on the fact that when regolith, the term used for the very fine-grained material on the moon's surface, is heated to 700 degrees Celsius, over 85% of the trapped helium-3 is released. The remotely operated miner shown here simply collects lunar regolith from the surface and uses solar energy beamed to it from a fixed mirror to drive off the trapped gases. The warm regolith is then dropped back to the lunar surface. Thus, there would be no large open pits or hauling of material over long distances. The only visible evidence of this kind of mining would be the elimination of small craters and a slight rippling of the surface behind the miner. The principles of operation can be more clearly understood through the use of three-dimensional computer modeling and animation. The forward bucket wheel would transport the first one to two meters of loose regolith into the front of the vehicle for processing. The regolith is transported by the bucket wheel to a lifting belt and then placed on several vibrating screens to separate out the large stones and eventually keep only the grain smaller than one millimeter in diameter. The fine-grained mixture would then be passed through an electrostatic precipitator to reject all grains larger than 100 microns. The ejected material would be immediately returned to the lunar surface and only the very fine-grained particles would enter the heating chamber. The solar energy relayed from the large focusing mirrors is collected and further concentrated into a beam which heats a liquid metal contained in heat pipes. The regolith is flowed down over the heat pipes to reach temperatures of 700 degrees Celsius. Helium-3, as well as the hydrogen, water, nitrogen, methane, and carbon dioxide would be removed from the regolith. The hot, depleted regolith would then be used to heat the incoming colder material, and eventually the warm, spent material would be ejected out the back of the miner. The gases would be collected in gas tanks on the back of the miner, which can be periodically replaced and transported back to a lunar base for separation on the moon. The helium can be easily separated from the other volatiles during the long 14 Earth Day lunar night, where the temperatures plunge to over 200 degrees Celsius below zero. At these low temperatures, all the gases except hydrogen and helium will have either liquefied or frozen. It is relatively easy to complete the separation of helium-3 from hydrogen and helium-4 by processes well known to Earth scientists. The byproducts, such as nitrogen, water, hydrogen, and carbon dioxide, will be crucial for life support on the lunar surface, as well as for supplying spaceships on their way to Mars. Once the helium-3 is liquefied, it can be returned to the Earth for use in fusion power plants.
The valuable cargo could be transferred to a shuttle vehicle at the space station Freedom, and the liquefied helium-3 could be transported to Earth. For example, 25 tons of helium-3, which would fit in the cargo bay of a spaceship the size of the present U.S. shuttle, could provide all of the electricity consumed in the United States in 1990. It would do this without generating any greenhouse gases, acid rain, or solid waste. There would be a relatively small amount of radioactivity remaining in the reactor after 40 years of operation. However, this radioactivity could be disposed of much in the same way we isolate radioactive hospital waste today. Fusion reactors operating with helium-3 will provide economical electrical energy with minimal risk of accidents that could leak harmful radioactivity into the environment. With such superior safety features, the power plants could be sited close to cities, thus greatly reducing the need for high voltage transmission lines. We are fortunate to live at a time when our capabilities to explore and live in space can also help to solve the energy problems on the Earth. The moon may be only the first of many places in our solar system where we find answers to the growing list of energy related problems we'll face in the 21st century.